Hi everyone, welcome to Cannabis Tech Talks, your weekly source for news and insights at the intersection of cannabis and technology. Shout out to our title sponsor, PolyScience, for supporting this podcast and helping us bring you the latest developments in this exciting field. This is Patricia Miller, Executive Editor. Joining me today are two essential members of Death Row Cannabis, Legacy Cultivator AK and Snoop Dogg's sound engineer and self-described weed confidant, Shaggy. We'll discuss cultivation, technology, and what sets Death Row Cannabis apart from the competition. I'd love a little bit of background, I guess, on, you know, what inspired the the launch of Death Row Cannabis. I don't know if that's something, you know, both of you are super privy to, but I was curious as to the thought process behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Shag, that sounds, uh, you know, you're the godfather of the whole situation, man. You want to take that one? Yeah, I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, so the whole the whole thought process behind bringing Death Row Cannabis as a brand was, um, you know, it has a large uh, historical value to it, right? Especially in the West Coast. It was such a iconic period in time. Um, and it, for music as well as cannabis in general, like the way people were using cannabis, the type of people that were meeting each other, um, just the whole landscape kind of changed and it, and it happened on a global level, right? Like people on the other side of the planet started doing things and that they were seeing and hearing on the West coast. And so it was just a really good period of, in time. And uh, we wanted to pay an homage to that and, um, and give back to the community out here. That's kind of helped make it what it is. So, you know, our whole, our whole ideal was to uh really bring some some good value to the customers and uh kind of correct some things that we've seen in the market out here um as far as just bringing really good quality at a really good price point and really trying to take care of the customers at the end of the day especially in the landscape where we knew we were stepping in and there's a lot of celebrity brands and there's a lot of there's a lot of things on the market where people get kind of like a they have a, a idea of what it's going to be like from other experiences that they've had. So we kind of were fighting a little uphill battle with that as an image. So we wanted to make sure when we came out that uh, people knew it wasn't just going to be like another hyped up celebrity brand, that it was actually more of a culture brand really for the people uh, than it was for just being a, a hype celebrity brand. So that was kind of the the thought process behind it really. That's I've been working for Snoop for 14 years as his personal engineer. So I'm tied in really heavy to the music side of things. So for me, the death row records and death row cannabis kind of just married up together perfectly. So you brought a lot of that cultural piece to it. Yeah, I've been, I've been working with Snoop for 14 years. Um, and on that time I've, you know, gotten a lot of weed for him and really dialed in what it is that he likes. Um, I grow myself. And so sometimes I bring some, weed that I had grown and and he got to know that I knew what I was talking about when it came to more than just like smoking good weed as far as looking for quality and stuff so I kind of became like unofficial like quality control for uh for Snoop Dogg for a lot of years um and then that just kind of translated over with the cannabis industry and then um yeah death row cannabis as it is and being a west coast brand it you know has to be a has to be good to represent that yeah I could appreciate that and I know AK, your your publicist mentioned that you're responsible for selecting the growers for the brand. Can you tell me what you sort of look for in a cultivator? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I think our biggest thing is just uh, you can really tell when a group is 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 doing it, you know, strictly for money or doing it out of passion and having money just be a byproduct of chasing their passion. Um, for me personally, like that's one of the main things that I'm always trying to track. I want to make sure that like people are actually about the weed and, uh, actually care about what they're growing and what they're putting out there. Cause you know, um, I think the simplest way to put it is a, a little bit of love goes a long way. Um, even when you're growing cannabis. So, uh, you know, that's, that's my biggest thing. Other, other than that, it's, it's cleanliness, um, you know, consistency, cleanliness, um, just kind of overall hygiene of, of their grow. Um, and then the third thing that, that really sticks out is obviously is, you know, I'm, I'm an old school legacy guy. I have a lot of friends that have licenses. Um, and there's a lot of guys that 
have brought, you know, certain genetics out to the table that, that nobody else gets to see, you know? So the third thing is, is like, cool, you know, you guys have all the, the prerequisites and you've got some fire cuts that are unique to you guys. And, you know, not the same thing that, that everybody else has in the industry. Um, that's always a huge one for us, you know, just trying to keep it unique and, and uh, clean and consistent. You know, if you can hit those three check marks, check boxes, then, you know, we're usually pretty happy with working with you. I like that. And that kind of brings me to my next question. Um, how do you decide which, which strains or cultivars you want to, you want to bring to the brand? Um, a lot of it is, you know, as Shag mentioned, he's, he's, he's been dogs QC guy for a long time, as far as just cannabis coming through. And, you know, both of us are, are pretty heavy smokers ourselves. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, if we dig it and we find that it's unique compared to everything else that we're seeing, and there's just something a little different or unique about it, um, we kind of run through there, but, you know, Shag and I have, have happily, uh, spent a lot of hours doing R and D and making sure that, <laughs> that what we're sending out there is, is something that we would smoke too. I mean, I think any of the real guys that are like real cannabis guys, um, are classic dudes that have been in it for a while or long time, heavy smokers, um, I think the key always boils down to like, if you wouldn't smoke it, then you shouldn't be putting it in a bag and trying to make money off of it. There's a lot of things out there and, and not to say that, that you can't hit, you know, different price points and different markets and different, different levels, just like any other commodity, but you can still do all of those things while maintaining quality as, as the key component, you know? Yeah. Well said. Um, I'm curious, Shaggy, how would you describe, snoop's taste in cannabis is it sort of those same same things he's looking for i mean yeah snoop just snoop just loves really good weed right um <laughs> he just wants to smoke some good weed at the end of the day that's kind of where my job kind of ended up manifesting was because like people would bring through big bags of weed and he'd be looking at it and you know he wouldn't necessarily know he knows good weed and he knows a lot about it, but when it comes to the growing process or even like down to, you know, some of the minute things with the flush and the cure, being able to taste that, um, you know, he would always kind of bring me in to be the bad guy to tell people if, if it wasn't that great. Um, and I'd have to let them know like, yeah, you know, your, 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 your cure is a little off. I can still taste a lot of nitrogen. It tastes like a bag of lawnmower clippings here, you know, like <laughs> I always had to do that kind of stuff. So, um, his taste though is just is just good weed you know um as far as strains go you know he's always liked og that's why we one of the first things we did was secure a really nice sfv og um and we brought that in the first drop and we've kept that as a staple and it will always be a staple because that that is just even just on the west coast out here a really good og is um is just a staple um it's a must have yeah i can appreciate that how did the partnership with Death Row and Cookies come together? So I'm also the VP of Cultivation for TRP, who's one of the bigger partners with Cookies. I think we have like just shy of 30 stores across the country. The Florida operation is uh, TRPs as well. So over the last like about 18 months now, um, I've been heading up their whole situation over there. So any cultivations that come online or any cultivations that they're partnered with. It's basically my job to to basically design, build, and set the SOPs to operate and then oversee the operations of the gardens for them. So currently, like our biggest project, like I mentioned, is in Florida. Um, they've had me up and down the East Coast the last couple months. And honestly, over the last 18 months, I've been all over the country um, checking out grows, walking through spots, um, really doing QC, QA, uh, helping these guys. You know, my background... My dad's a general contractor. My background's in construction. From construction, I went into growing cannabis. So, like, I know how to put the whole thing together from A to Z. And then I can also come in and, and pick it apart and and help these guys basically get to that consistent quality and everything else. So, um, you know, because of all that, I ended up getting hired by TRP, you know, obviously Cookies. And uh, it just made sense that, you know, the first place we drop it in, in Southern California would be the nine shops that, that TRP owns and operates here. So... Yeah, that's cool. I know that, you know, you've both been kind of can of sewers on the West Coast for a long time, and now you're traveling all over the country. How have you seen cannabis culture sort of change since legalization? That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of things. I mean, you know, we we both come from an era where 
it wasn't cool to grow weed. And uh, if you did it, you know, you were one of the crazy guys that was risking it all and trying to make it happen. So it's been real interesting to see you know, over the last 15 years, it, you know, go from black market to, to the gray market with the medical system and then rolling into the rec market. Um, I think the biggest thing that you see out there is, it's kind of ties back to, to one of the first questions that I answered for you, where it's like, you just kind of see the guys that are passionate about it and that are still doing it. And they're all about it for the plant and the guys that are just chasing dollar signs. Mm -hmm. Um, it's always very refreshing. I'd say culturally, like, I guess to back it up a little bit, culturally, the, the biggest thing and, and, you know, probably my favorite thing that I've seen about it is just its general acceptance overall. Um, for example, like even, you know, uh, when, when rec first passed uh, in Colorado and Washington, I'm originally from Seattle. So like when rec first passed in Washington, it was almost impossible to get any kind of equipment, um, you know, any kind of specialty stuff that might be used in, in other industries or big ag and stuff like that. The second that they find out that you're a cannabis deal, uh, they either just didn't want to deal with you or they would, you know, impose the, what we call a green tax where, okay, mm -hmm. cool. You guys, you know, I always like to joke around and be like, I feel like a lot of people think that these growers are just, you know, <laughs> doing whatever, like peeing in a pot and growing gold on the backside. And it, it's never <laughs> like that. You know, the, the struggle that we had to go through early on just to get the most basic equipment and the most uh, and the most basic things that you would need to run or operate a business or start to search into, like you couldn't get it. Um, now it's a different story. Now you have all kinds of tech companies, all kinds of lab equipment companies like the, the doors have kind of kicked open. And so the ability to explore and, and push the envelope with cannabis and, and kind of get it caught up to all these other industries um, is probably my favorite thing that I've seen, you know, since legalization. Like it's just a lot more freedom and the ability to to hone in on our craft and, and make things better. You know, um, that's been really nice. A lot less red tape. Yeah. Which is crazy to say in the cannabis world because we still have crazy red tape. I mean, we still have to hold video longer than uh, than a nuclear reactor does um, just, you know, for some plants. So we still got a long ways to go. But compared to where we were at, you know, 10 years ago, um, it's, it's leaps and bounds. Yeah, that's insightful. Is there anything um, you wanted to add to that, Shaggy? Um, I think AK hit it on the head. I think just an overall cultural acceptance has been really nice to see um especially coming from somebody who's in the position of building brands for snoop right now is like snoop has always been available to everybody he's never just been you know pigeonholed into like one type of person like he everybody loves snoop um and even you know any products he's ever put out he's always put out to be available for everybody um they've it's never just been for whoever wants to pay the most money for it um and so like in the cannabis space this is going to be really really awesome because like i've met people from you know like 60 year old white grandmas all the way down the line that everybody wants to smoke some some snoop dog weed in california um because it hasn't <laughs> been out here so um it's just a cool opportunity and like seeing the overwhelmingly positive uh response from people has been really awesome as well um I'm just seeing people that you would never expect to talk to um, and, you know, talking about death row records and death row cannabis. Um, and it's just really cool to see. Um, we're a long way from where we were, you know, 50, 60 years ago on this for sure. Um, I was born in 89, so I'm 33. Um, I, I came in kind of, you know, it, it, my whole lifetime, like AK said, it was like right there in the middle of being like accepted and on the tail end of like some really extreme prejudice against that plant so just seeing it uh seeing it pop up everywhere and get more accepted around the, the country has been really refreshing for sure yeah it's been a cool yeah. process to watch yeah i uh, wanted to touch on something you kind of mentioned ak was um you know kind of the increase in technology in the space um you know i know growers are using a lot more automation, anything from like sensors to detect inputs to like cryo freezing their buds after they're harvested. How do you feel about that sort of increase in technology in the grow process? I absolutely love it. I think, uh, you know, for me, as much as I love growing weed, like uh, it becomes pretty monotonous of just rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. So it's 
given me an avenue to kind of explore and, and make things more efficient at the same time. So I get a tinker and make things more efficient at the same time. So for me, it's uh, kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, it keeps me busy. It's really exciting. Um, you know, I travel back and forth from from Los Angeles to, to Florida about every two weeks. And the only reason I'm able to do something like that is because of the new technology that's out there. You know, um, we use, a, I'm sure you've heard of Arroyo. We're big on Arroyo. Um, very big on uh, Standard Controls is another company that we work with that helps us with all of our environmental controls and everything like that. So it's created a situation where, you know, I can run tens of thousands of square feet from, from literally anywhere. You know, you want to go to like the... Uh, <laughs> You know, the the old school joke where it's always like, I'd love to just do my work from the beach. Like, that's a reality for me. If I really want to, like, I can go sit on the beach and pull my phone out or pull my laptop up and make sure that everything is going the way it's supposed to be going, you know. Um, so the ability to, to actually, like, get work done, efficiencies added in, you know, like you mentioned, uh, just on the automation side, the, the irrigation and where all of that stuff has gone since... Uh, since this whole thing started where you know, they're building some things specific to cannabis, but again, kind of ties back to like people being more open. Like I'm able to get contracts and uh, uh, with uh, accounts with, you know, big ag corporations, guys that are really like, you know, have been helping the agricultural industry for a hundred years type thing. And now I can have the same access to the technology those guys are using. So, you know, that ability is, has been, has been crazy, you know, and, my background's in construction too. Like, so a lot of this stuff is like, like for example, all the irrigation and the water design down in Florida is, is all from myself. So, um, you know, it's, it's made my life exponentially easier and it's given me the ability to really like to spread my wings and, and get a lot more stuff done. Yeah. I think that was a great overview of it. I like the idea of being able to to do your job from the beach sometimes. Um, and I think <laughs> as a grower, that's probably pretty, pretty recent. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's very recent. And the other side of it too, is, is it, it gives you an extra added layer of security too, you know? So if, if something goes wrong at 3 AM, I'm not going to find out about it at six or seven in the morning when I get back, like hopefully I'll wake up to my phone binging and, and I'll know that, you know, we got to kick into emergency mode and, and go fix something. If a pump goes out, if lights go out or if the AC goes out or something like even the most basic things where it's just a simple alert can literally save you hundreds of thousands of dollars or just from flat out going out of business from failure, you know? Um, so it definitely, you know, it makes me sleep a little bit better at night knowing that, uh, knowing that that's like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, I bet. And um, something I thought was interesting too, I saw in the initial press release back in December, it mentioned that death row will unite you know, all of these different, it's, it's like, I think they described it as a multi-category cultural platform, <laughs> all united by the blockchain for a new generation. Do you guys uh, know anything about what's going to be happening with the blockchain or how that's going to be incorporated into the brand? Um, You know, to be honest with you, I, I don't know a ton about it, but I guess I could tell you that, like, I know that, uh, the dog and his son Cordell have, you know, really been focused on turning death row into a blockchain based, uh, a blockchain based record label and kind of working into that. We've been talking to a few people, you know, that do metaverse design type stuff where we could have a situation where you, you know, you can, you can basically have like, uh, you know, Snoop Snooper market, or maybe it becomes a situation where it's a, a retail launch where we're dropping a new drop and you could be there in the metaverse and, kind of tie into it from there um but honestly that's that's about as far as my literacy goes with uh with the heavier blockchain stuff and the metaverse stuff but i would just take over and say that honestly with with what to, to, to jump off and of what ak said uh snoop and cordell are doing so much in the metaverse right now and with uh crypto and the blockchain that like and with that industry being what it is it's kind of a limitless thing you know it's it's as far as our imagination will let us go with it um so I would just say that, that, yeah, there's some really cool stuff that, that we're thinking about and working on. Um, and we're definitely going to be at the forefront of tying that, tying all those things together. You know, the music and the cannabis go together already. So. Yeah. Yep. I'll be excited to to learn more about it as it sort of keeps unfolding. I think that's, that's an exciting part of the, the brand. Yeah, for sure. And I think that kind of helps to something that I guess I kind of, 
meant to touch on when you're asking about like the legacy and the idea behind death row is like, you know, I think it's really important for us and, you know, dog made it very clear to us that like, yo, this, this thing's not about me. This thing's about death row. And we're building this brand for death row. And I think using the metaverse and tying the weed and the music together via the metaverse will really push that, you know? So like, we're really trying to make it, this whole thing is death row focused. It's not Snoop Dogg focused. Snoop just happens to be the owner of death row records. But Snoop obviously isn't Death Row Records, you know? Um, so I think the metaverse is going to help us quite a bit in kind of getting that message across the way we'd like to. That's cool. Um, I guess I, I'm also interested to know what have you got on the horizon as far as like new product offerings or expanding the 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 brand? Um, we got a couple of things. So right now, you know, we've got we've got just our flower out. We've got uh, our pre rolls out. All of our pre rolls currently are infused. Um, I know a natural step behind that for us is just going to be dropping the regular pre roll that just won't knock you on your butt when you smoke a little half grammar. Um, something a little bit more mellow, so more people that maybe aren't as heavy of smokers can enjoy it. Um, on the flower side, you know, we've got a, you know, we've we've got a bunch of other things coming through. I mean, our goal is to basically hit hit every sector and, and, you know, have the best product that we possibly can at the best value on each level, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, I think that hit a lot of the key, key points I wanted to touch on. Are there any, um, you know, final takeaways you'd like to share that maybe we didn't hit on during our convo? Uh, I'm good. Shake. You got anything? I think we hit everything. Um, really appreciate your time um with like ak said a lot of this is just about getting the message out there um you know that this isn't another celebrity brand um yes snoop owns death row records but this is a death row brand which is a west coast brand which is a cultural brand um and we're really just trying to make a splash in a really really flooded uh market and we're trying to get that value back to the customers um, you know, it's a little bit of a miseducated market. Um, so we want to, one thing we're focusing on a lot is terpenes and how that plays a role in your endocannabinoid system and the actual delivery of the THC and what makes a TH or what makes an indica high versus a sativa high and how some sativas have indica terpenes. So you get cross different effects and how that is more beneficial for you on a medical side as well. You know, because we all use this recreationally, but there's a huge medical side to this that we all believe in. And um, the terpene profiles are going to be really important in how you steer what strain to what patient based on what they need. Um, it's not all about having a high THC content. You know, AK has said before, you know, he'd rather smoke some weed. And I would, too. That was like 18 percent THC, but had like three or four percent terpenes than some 31, 32 percent THC with like 1% terpenes, um, you know, I get a better, uh, more enjoyable high out of that. So that was one thing we really focused on with all of our products um, is uh, focusing on the terps. And uh, we even put the terp percentages on our uh, testing on the back of our flower. Um, our infused pre-rolls are infused with terpenes as well. Um, and that's not just for flavor. That's also because it helps with the delivery of the liquid diamonds and uh, really gets you the best, uh, the best experience you you know if you're going to buy something infused you want to get the most out of it um and i think that people just don't know enough about it they get a misrepresentation of terpenes and they get kind of a bad uh feeling about it because it's kind of like a hype thing or people are using it where it's like they're using it to mask bad weed or they're trying to make like flavors that are unappealing to some people um and it's not so they, they don't have an understanding of like what natural terpenes are and how they're beneficial and that it's not just like a hype thing to move product it's actually something that's naturally there and it plays a big role in, in what your experience in that plan is going to be so um that's the only other thing I, I think we didn't really touch on was that um and i think you know it's hard for a lot of people to make that stand right now because it's such a, a saturated market, but I think as Death Row Records has such a big name to it and people, you get their attention with it, you know, maybe we can make that splash in the industry um, and kind of start educating people a little bit more and bringing them value as well. I'm so it's, glad it's, you it's gonna be, brought it's, that it's gonna, up. Go on. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to say it's it's just about it's, it's about trying to help shift the culture and, and try to do better by uh by the cannabis community because we're all part of it and uh we all love it and it's a really good 
good community. So we want to represent that in the marketplace as well, you know, on the professional side of it as well. Absolutely. I think that's really needed in the space. And I've been smoking for like most of my, (laughs) most of my life, adult life. And, um, I think just recently started honing in on that myself, like that I prefer a lower percentage with a higher terp and really dialing in what, what a good smoke means to me. So I appreciate that you're bringing that to, to the brand and that offering that knowledge out to the people who are, who are interested in it. Yeah. I think education is going to, you know, one of our, honestly, one of our biggest focal points for this whole project too is, we want people to understand, you know, everybody loves their weed, but nobody really knows why they love their weed, you know? Mm. Um, and so, you know, that's a big, that's a big thing for us, for sure. Um, you know, the market shifted from obviously, you know, prop 215 days, medical days where it was more deli style. And, uh, you know, when I remember back to the, those days, I had a couple shops in Seattle, medical shops in Seattle. And, you know, no one very, very rarely did anyone ever ask or was concerned about and, you know, any percentages or anything, I mean, testing results for that matter, like I'm, I'm very happy that we're in a tested situation and people aren't getting some of the nasty stuff that, that people like to put on their weed out there anymore. But as far as like potency and everything else, it's also, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, right? Like now people come in and I call it, they come in and do Texas buying, right? So they just come in, they look for the biggest number and <laughs> they go for that, but they don't really know like, you know, what they're getting or why they're getting it versus when they used to be able to walk into a dispensary and pop open eight jars, you know, and sniff the jars, maybe sniff some coffee in between to clean their palate. Like it was a whole different experience and a whole different way that people were choosing their weed before. Um, and now those same things that they were smelling and seeing and touching, uh, they've got to try and, you know, they got to try and get that info basically out of a little, out of a little sticker that has their test results on there. So kind of explaining to them like the science behind the numbers and how those numbers and stuff might correlate to a previous experience like that. Or, you know, the first time they saw a sack of weed that they actually were like, damn, that's fire, you know, trying to educate and, and push down that line. So people really understand what's going on. I I think most people don't realize that cannabis is as complicated as something like wine, you know, the same way you have sommeliers, like we could do the same thing in the cannabis world. And we want to show people that and Maybe maybe light a couple of people's passions in the process too, hopefully. Yeah, I love that. Well, I hope I can help um, you know, share that information and that message uh for the brand in this article. And um I'll be sure to run it by you guys to fact check before it goes goes to print. So I appreciate wow. your time and um and your insights. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time, absolutely. If you'd like to learn more about emerging cannabis technologies, be sure to like this podcast and subscribe to Cannabis Tech Talks. You can pick up the most recent issue of Cannabis and Tech Today on Barnes & Noble newsstands across the country, or grab a copy for free on canatechtoday.com. This podcast is produced in part by Pretty Easy Podcasts. Visit prettyeasypodcasts.com if you're looking for professional production quality at an affordable rate. Until next time, stay elevated. Hey, hello, I'm Tommy Chong from Cheech and Chong. Wait, you didn't think people would know who I am? Duracho. Uh, this is Duracho. This is Duracho. This is Duracho. No. Hey, I don't talk like that. You want me to sell this? Buy it. Try Duracho or else. If you want something really nice in your laboratory, buy Duracho. You can't go wrong.